This lecture is on the Earth's climate system. Each fall, polar bears migrate through Churchill, Manitoba on their way to the Hudson Bay to wait for new sea ice to form so they can hunt seals. There's been a 17% reduction in Hudson Bay polar bears in the last 30 years. Uh, rising temperatures in the Arctic cause sea ice to melt earlier in the spring and form later in the fall. And the bears hang around in Churchill longer waiting for the sea ice to form. So who's in more danger, the tourist or the bear? There's Churchill next to the Hudson Bay and in the lower picture you see a bear trap. Polar Bear Jail, Churchill, Canada. Uh, polar bears that wander into Churchill are captured by the trap and placed in jail until the Hudson Bay freezes over. Um, definition of climate is a description of the weather conditions for a region averaged over several decades. The climate of every region on Earth, on Earth has changed often we see a picture at the top and we see a picture of the same location at the bottom. Um, at the top we see that valley that's full of a glacier in 1941. It's from it's the Riggs Glacier in Glacier National Park in Alaska in 1941. In 2004 you see the glaciers receded way back in the distance and you have a fjord back in there. So uh, the climate around that Glacier Bay National Park has drastically changed in that 50 years. The Arctic is a prime example of a region that's currently recording climate change. Signs of change are decline in polar bear population, rise in annual of av rise of average temperatures by two to three degrees centigrade. Uh, this temperature rise is more than double what is observed throughout the rest of the world. Uh, glaciers are shrinking and you also have a rising sea level uh, and increased coastal erosion. Widespread and steady decline in the Arctic sea ice over the last few decades is occurring and that puts cold water into the Arctic Ocean which could disrupt the oceanic conveyor belt and we talked about that in a few lectures ago. Now, the worst case scenario is that higher temps reduce annual volume of the sea ice exposing more open water in the Arctic Ocean. Water has a lower albedo which absorbs more heat from the sun and so sea ice forms later in the fall in the center and not as widespread and melts earlier in the spring. This isn't the only time that's happened. It's happened a number of times um, over uh, uh, even even history actually. There's some thought that uh, the sea ice melted for a while even um, at, um, even as early as 500 years ago but um, there's some argument about that. Let's continue the worst case scenario. Um, if you have a melting of ice that changes density and salinity in the Arctic Ocean, um, the freshwater input from Greenland further dilutes salt content uh, the reduction of sinking water at the northern end of the Gulf Stream slows the conveyor belt where it, um, it gets cold and then sinks down and then goes down the Atlantic and then across to the Pacific and Indian Ocean. Um, and the temperature of the North Atlantic uh, decrease with this slowing Gulf Stream. And the best case scenario is that temperature increase in a short term variation and lower temperatures begin to prevail. You have sea ice volume that increases and increases albedo, reducing absorption of heat. And sea ice forms earlier in the fall and stays around longer in the spring. Seawater salinity increases with increasing sea ice. And less melting of ice sheet on Greenland and elsewhere and temperatures in the North Atlantic gradually decrease and return to levels similar to, the, to those in the 1980s. This doesn't seem likely. Um, there tends to be a warming trend each year. Eight of the ten hottest years in record have occurred in the last decade. Uh, the big gorilla in the room is our humans affecting the climate and our changes uh, being, being caused by a human impact. So the pol politicians are fighting about that. 
Um, whether or not uh, you agree with that from a political standpoint or not, or even a scientific standpoint, uh, we're, go we're going to talk about uh, global climate change in this lecture and the next lecture. Um, one reason is, is because um, it's an opportunity to talk about climate change and climates have changed throughout Earth history. Secondly, it's really important to know what the discussion is so that you can be knowledgeable about what you're reading and you may be even in a position of, of affecting what's going on politically. What will happen to Arctic Ocean salinity values when sea ice melts? Well, um, there'll be a decrease due to freshwater input. So salinity decreases because um, uh, the, the it's What effect might freshwater input near the Arctic have on thermohaline circulation? Well, there'd be a decrease in circulation because of decreasing densities. Um, more dense means more circulation. Let's look at the four maps, and we'll spend a few slides with these maps. What patterns do you see? Um, this is climate. Well, um, there's significant um, patterns that emerge from these. Temperatures decrease with increasing latitude north and south in the e equator. Wait, that's kind of we, we kind of know that. Um, and the equator receives more solar energy. You know, we kind of know that too. So one nice thing about climate is it's not is it's um, there's some obvious things, but then there's some real subtle things that are important to uh, pay attention to as we go through this. Uh, so there's where the equator is. And uh, so temperature and cloud cover is highest around there. And precipitation is high over the equator. And one reason is is because clouds go way on up and um, then they rain there. Um, there's high, there's um, air pressure, a lower air pressure there, and um, um, the deserts tend to be um, north and south of the equator, not over the equator. Um, so let's look at some more patterns there. Um, temperature range is greater for continents than for oceans because water. Clouds are concentrated in irregular bands parallel to the equator in latitude 60 degrees north and south, and those latitudes also have high precipitation and low atmospheric pressure. So, uh, desert belts are located around 30 degrees north and south latitude. So you get lots of precipitation around the equator, um, lots of precipitation um, um, at 60 degrees north and south. And um, at 30 degrees north and south, you tend to have deserts. There's where the equator is. There's 60 degrees north and south. And there's 60 degrees south. There's 30 degrees north of the equator, where we have lots of deserts. And 30 degrees south. And you tend to have deserts. There's, there's a number of reasons we have deserts, but uh, one reason is is because they, they're around that 30 degree marker. The following map shows two locations in South America. Let's predict which location has the world's highest average annual precipitation. Well, remember you have lots of rainfall over the equator. So that's that location right there has the highest annual precipitation in the world. Well, where's the lowest annual precipitation in the world? It's right there um, in Chile, northern Chile. And um, so Florida lies at the same latitude as the Sahara Desert. Why do you think Florida is not a hot, dry desert? Well, it's got lots of water around it. If we first of all look at a non-rotating Earth model, and this, um, this section is about global air circulation. The rising air at the equator and the sinking air at the poles would form opposing limbs or loops of a large-scale circulation pattern. And um, that would be a convection cell where cold air sinks and warm air rises. Warm air rises at the equator where you have lots of solar energy. Cold air sinks at the poles where it gets the coldest. Um, 
where is there low pressure and where is there high pressure? Well, low pressure is where air rises at the equator and high pressure is where air descends at the poles. So air going up makes low pressure. Air coming down uh, makes high pressure. And you think about that, if you take your hand and push down, it's higher pressure. If you pull something up, it's decreasing pressure. It does the same thing with the weight of air. Uh, because the Earth ro rotates, it complicates the system. Now, regardless of the Earth's rotation, warm, humid air expands and rises at the equator, and that forms low-pressure systems uh, right over that equa equator in a continuous band of clouds. Um, it's interesting to fly over the equator, over a rainforest area, and just huge, huge cumulonimbus clouds rise up there from those updrafts over that moist, tropical, rainy jungle. Um, it's, it's kind of scary because they're just so big, and plane, planes won't fly through them. Uh, the Coriolis effect deflate, deflects the winds to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Well, the north moving air is continuously deflected east and is moving all, almost directly eastward by the time it reaches 30 degrees north. And um, that's, what, that's a location what we call the subtropical jet stream. Well, a jet stream is, a, um, uh, is air in the upper troposphere that moves uh, quickly at speeds approaching 61 miles an hour. Those jet streams will wiggle around, and planes try to fly in the jet stream because if they fly with the jet stream, uh, they save fuel. Um, you see a cross-section from the North Pole to the equator in that little picture at the bottom. And so you have uh, the equator, where you have a Hadley cell, convection cell, rising up from the equator and then sinking right about 30 degrees north. And that's why you have the, the, um, that's why you have the uh, um, deserts at 30 degrees north, because, because the, the rain's already dumped at the equator, and so the air comes back down, and it's dry air. Then you have the polar cell that is um, sinking at the pole, and um, then it warms up as it moves south, and then it rises, and um, it meets what's called the feral cell, which is a cell that's in the middle of the two. And that's why you have some rain at 60 degrees north also, because, um, and that's why we have the kind of weather we have um, across the continental United States and North America, because that, those polar cells and the feral cells are, are meeting together along with the um, the um, air masses that we talked about in the section on weather. Descending air warms adiabatically and its relative humidity decreases. So um, that's that Hadley cell as air comes down um, it's descending adiabatic it, it's warming adiabatically as it descends from the top of the troposphere. Um, so here's some terms. Trade winds are the prevailing surface winds that deflected north and south at those areas of descending air. So the trade winds um, are uh, there between the feral cells and the Hadley cells. The Hadley cell is a continuous convection cell formed by columns of rising air at the equator and descending um, at about 30 degrees north. And a polar cell is anchored by a column of descending air at the polar regions, and it goes as far south as it can until it meets the feral cell, which is a mid-latitude convection system um, that separates thermal, thermal circulation cells. It's not well defined because it's kind of in between the other two cells, and it goes back and forth. Um, Atmospheric circulation can be divided into three convection cells in each hemisphere. And here we have the jet streams that are kind of dividing those three cells. Um, the Hadley cell, the feral cell, and the polar cell. And um, these bands of wind are often disrupted by variations of topography, especially in the northern hemisphere, because there's lots more land in the northern hemisphere.
Um, some jet streams can even reach really fast speeds, which again the um, the air companies like because it it saves them fuel. So here we have the polar jet stream and the blue and the uh, subtropical jet stream in red. Which one of the following diagrams most accurately displays atmospheric circulation patterns in the northern hemisphere? Well, B does because climate regions are differentiated by their temperatures and precipitation and the vegetation that results from those. Uh, there's six types of climate regions according to the Copen Geiger uh, scale. I'll let you read the details. Uh, you need to know the details and be, or be able to at least get to them quickly so you know that you can find the answers. Uh, but a tropical climate, an example, would be Key West, Florida. A dry climate, an example, would be Albuquerque, New Mexico. A warm, temperate climate, an example, would be New Orleans, Louisiana. Cool temperate climate would be Flint, Michigan. A polar climate that would be Barrow in northern Alaska. And a highland climate uh, would be Blue Canyon in the Sierra, Sierra Nevada Mountains in California. This averaging misses microclimates, and so you want to uh, just be aware of that. This is the kind of gra graph you do you find when you look at uh, climates and there's a lot of good information on this. Uh, the gray area there, the gray bars are amounts of rainfall and you can see the scale in millimeters on the right for rainfall. And the blue dotted line is the um, mean minimum and the um, green dot are the mean maximum. Well those those are temperatures. So you have rainfall and you have temperatures. Well remember climates and are compare the amount of precipitation to the and temperature to, to tell us something about climate. So we can use these kind of graphs to uh, understand what type of climate we're looking at. And in this case we're looking at a warm temperate climate in Sydney, Australia. And if you go back to your definition, you can see uh, that um, um, the, the climate here would fit the description of the amount of rainfall or precipitation and the um, kind of temperatures you'd find um, for a warm temperate climate. Uh, here's a map of global climate regions for these uh, six different um, for these six different climates. Uh, the green is tropical, the uh, yellow are dry climates, pink are warm temperate climates, uh, the, the uh, purple are cool temperate climates, blue are polar climates, um, and the uh, kind of uh, orange are highland climates, in other words they're mountains. Definition of an ecosystem is a, is a community of organisms that inhabit specific physical environments. Uh, biodiversity is the number of species in the ecosystem. A biome is a regional community of plants and animals named after the dominant type of education, of, vege <laughs> of education, of vegetation there. Humans, unlike other organizations, organisms inhabit a wide range of biomes. Well, why is that? Well, um, God created people with authority over nature and we've used that authority as a way to control nature around us and so we can live in all kinds of different biomes. Um, so here we have um, a different uh, examples in our um, map at the bottom. We see tundra, we see boreal forest, um, temperate deciduous and rainforests, temperate grassland, 
Mediterranean scrub forest, desert, tropical rainforest, tropical deciduous forest, tropical scrub forest, mountains, and uh, tropical grassland and savanna. What can you say about the relationship between population density and a climate region? Well, in terms of altitude, most organisms live in a narrow vertical band of land and shallow sea where the climate is warm and moist. In the map there, you can see that darker colors are higher population densities and lighter colors are lower population densities. If you look at the United States, you can see that's why the East Coast has so many people. There's just lots more people on the East Coast than there is uh, mid in the Midwest here. And if you look at northern India and eastern China, it's highly populated. Just if you travel there, just try and drive in traffic or spend time on a train, it's, there's just people everywhere. There's three major climate-related biome groups, grasslands, forests, and deserts. Um, and uh, just as uh, one, one example, a rainforests are a critical biome, and that's um, so you can take the, the, the major climate related group forests and break it into multiple types of forests. One of those is rainforests. Um, it dominates the uh, area around the equator. There are lots of rainforests around the equator, and you'd expect that because there's so much rain there. And there's lots and lots of different plant species and insect species, animal species, in rainforests. And one of the tragedies about losing rainforests is we're afraid that we'll not be able to understand those species and, and maybe even some uses for them, like for medicine and things, before they're, before they're gone. <clears throat> um, most species are found in the upper 200 meters of the ocean and below um, about 20,500 feet in altitude. And why is that? Well, you don't have a lot of sunlight below um, way down in the ocean. And so most, most, uh, an, most life in the ocean is at the very top of the ocean. And there's not a lot of oxygen above 20,000 feet. So, um, animals and plants aren't living up there either. Here we see the interaction between the biosphere, atmosphere, geosphere, and, and hydrosphere. Um, plants produce, animals consume. Plants produce, animals consume. And God created plants um, before he created animals because of that. There's a food chain that transfers energy between organisms Within an, within an ecosystem. And here we see um, some letters that are uh, keys to um, um, just a short shorthand for understanding what's happening in each one of those um, areas. And we'll take the geosphere as an example. Um, um, you have rock formation, you have fossil fuels, and you have human activity and you have organic decomposition as inputs and then outputs in the geosphere you have weathering mining fossil fuel combustion and um, so um, why is that important well let's take an example of rock formation if you have um, if you create limestone you're taking carbon out of a system somewhere else and putting carbon in that limestone and you're taking it out of the air or taking it out of the water so um, you're you're moving it out of the biosphere atmosphere or hydrosphere and putting it into the geosphere which statement regarding biodiversity and temperature extremes is most accurate well if you have lots of uh, biodiversity, in other words, diversity of life. Um, if you have if you have high biodiversity, um, then you have lots of adaptability to climate extremes.
um, predict biodiversity and species population and conditions in the Arctic. Well, you have low biodiversity and so you and you have low population densities. And globally, where would you be most likely to find type A and B climates? Well, that'd be tropical and dry. A is tropical and B is dry. Well, A is near the equator and B is 30 degrees latitude north or south of the equator. What happens to energy transfer every step up the food chain? Well, let's talk about the food chain. You have plants. Plants are eaten by animals and so animals are higher up the food chain. Well, less energy is available every step up the food chain and that's uh, there's a lot more plants that provide energy in the, in the food chain than animals. What would happen to alpine glaciers in Europe if average annual temperatures increased? Well they decrease in size because they melt. What makes an environment extreme? Uh, well exceptionally high or low temperatures or lack of precipitation. So a desert is extreme because you have either high or low temperatures and it's really dry. And you can have um, very cold dry deserts. And they're not, deserts aren't always hot. And an example of that is if you look on South America and the very lower part of Chile there, there's a desert and it's really cold in that desert in the southern part of Chile. Extreme environments reduce biodiversity and decrease population densities. You just, you just can't have as many living critters and plants in the kind of environment you're looking at there. It's snow and ice and it's hard to live there. And extreme environments fall within dry and polar climate regions. Um, the largest accumulations of snow and ice are in Greenland and Antarctica. And um, they have large glaciers in both of those. And there's a definition of a glacier. A glacier is a long-lived mass of snow, of slow-moving snow and ice on land. A long-lived mass of snow and ice on land and it slowly moves. Um, so here's a, in the picture, that's a, it's a landscape in Antarctica, Antarctica. And there's some climbers there on the way to Mount Vinson, which is the highest peak in Ant Antarctica. Um, another note about glaciers, um, there's two different types of glaciers. You've got continental glaciers that form at polar latitudes and cover like, like the whole continent. Um, and you had continental glacier at one time covered like all of Canada and came um, down into um, about half the United States and a huge ice sheet covering North America. Then you have alpine glaciers which are found in high elevations in mountainous regions and Glacier National Park is a good good example of um, where you have lots of glaciers in the mountain. Glaciers move and glaciers tell us something about climate change. Um, they're very good indicators of climate change. Alpine glaciers are the most susceptible to climate change. Um, glaciers can last for decades. They can last up to thousands of years. And glaciers are, are melting um, right now. So we can use glaciers to, to understand something about what's happening with, with um, average climates. Um, here's all kinds of features on a glaciers that are um, important to know. Um, first of all, the weight of a glacier is what causes it to move. You get a thick accumulation of snow and ice and it, it just crushes, um, crushing weight um, under it. And that then becomes kind of plastic and it starts to move down slope. Um, Alpine glaciers move about uh, 5 to 50 meters a year. Um, ice sheets or continental glaciers can move hundreds of meters a year. On those glaciers you get big cracks 
So if you would walk across the glacier, you'd have to figure out a way to how to get across huge cracks. You don't want to fall into one of those either. Uh, because remember, it's moving. <laughs> and um, so it might be challenging to, um, to get out. So crevices are steep, narrow cracks in the surface of a glacier. And it cha they changes, changes the glacier changes shape. Um, um, as the ice moves, it transports pieces of bedrock that fall off surrounding cliffs or are torn off by glaciers, and it it scoops up uh, bedrock underneath it and and uh, scoops up soil, and then dumps that soil um, on down later down um, downhill, or if in, in the case of a continental glacier on into the southern latitudes in the north or northern latitudes if it's a south or southern glacier. And here's a good example of um, what you'd see in the cross profile of a glacier. Glaciers are composed of ice. Um, snowflakes fall in the accumulation zone or are compacted into ice crystals. Um, one important thing is that, that air bubbles are trapped in those ice crystals and are buried in a glacier. So we can study those air bubbles and understand something about the atmospheric composition um, thousands um, of years ago because of, of air trapped in those bubbles. Um, you can count the layers in a glacier and to get an estimate of the glacier's age. And you can, you can hand count them and visually, you can core down through a glacier and visually count the layers to a point, but then when they're crushed so close down toward on down in glacier you you have to get a uh, a microscope or to uh, be able to read those or use um, use other means to be able to tell one one layer from another layer here's zones in an alpine glacier zones are based in elevation you have an accumulation zone where it's the highest and you get the thickest part of the glacier and that's where snow is added and it's um, you get more snow added there than uh, starts to melt. Then you get what's called an ablation zone, which is the other end of the glacier, where you have a lower thinning and you get more thawing. Um, then you get um, accumulation. Then you get a snow line. Snow line's a boundary be between the accumulation and the ablation zones. And the balance, the mass balance of a glacier is the difference between how much the ice and snow accumulates versus how much it melts. So if the mass balance is zero, the glacier will stay in one spot. If it's, um, if it's uh, increasing, the, the uh, glacier will grow. And so that's mass balance. Let's compare alpine to continental glaciers. What's similar about them is they all have accumulation zones, a snow line, and an ablation zone. They all result in erosion and, and depositional processes, and all are affected by global climate changes. What's different about them is alpine glaciers are smaller. Alpine glaciers are found in any latitude because uh, they're up in the mountains, and continental glaciers are presently only found near the poles, although um, 10,000 years ago they, they came on down in the continental United States. And continental glaciers are much thicker. So if ablation exceeds accumulation, then a glacier melts faster than new ice can be added. And then the front of the glacier will retreat upslope. Just some evidence of lots of ablation occurring um, in the North, North Cascade glaciers um, have recorded a steady decline in volume over the last two decades. That'd be the Cascade Mountains in, um, in uh, uh, Washington and Oregon. Uh, glaciers are about a third smaller today than they were just in the mid-1980s, not that long ago. And geologists can map the rate of melting by looking at the location of a terminal moraine and terminus of a glacier. In other words, it's the uh, dirt that's scraped and dumped at the front of a glacier. And so then you know, uh, if you keep track of where that is, then you know the glacier is melted or ablate, ablate, ablated so so far over so many years. Um, <clears throat> speaking of terminus and moraine, 
Uh, here's some words that are useful. Um, till, there's glacial till, and there's a tillite. So glacial till is um, um, dirt and rocks that are dumped by a glacier after it melts. And then a tillite is a rock that you take that till and you lithify it and uh, you get a tillite. Um, so as we, we, look, we see this glacier, this alpine glacier melting in the lower left, um, um, we see what's called a moraine. The edge of the moraine rep represents deposits formed when the terminus of the glacier remains in one location. So, glacial moraine. The presence of moraines in regions without present-day glaciers is evidence of more extensive glaciers in the geologic past. Here we see the Gan Gotri Glacier in India. And in 2001, you can see the dark blue outline. And you can see the um, it has recessed uh, some one, two, maybe four kilometers since 1780, um, uh, 200 years ago, 250 years ago. Um, in the right picture, you can see the Lar Larsen ice shelf in Antarctica. And you can see icebergs breaking off in a glacier in Greenland in the northern in the nor in the upper picture on the left. Uh, some processes and features that are important to know about glaciers: um, bits of frozen uh, rock frozen into the base of a glacier la act like sandpaper, and they scrape up every all kinds of stuff underneath it. And uh, you can look at uh, igneous or metamorphic rocks in fields in Minnesota and you can see scrape marks uh, where glaciers have scraped across those rocks. At the terminus or the end of a glacier you have unsorted debris and that's from a clay size to house sized boulders and we call that a till and it's an unsorted deposit at the um, there. And ridges of till surround the edge of a glacier, and we call those moraines. And a terminal moraine marks the furthest limit of a glacier. And you can see a terminal moraine from the Kansas and period of glaciation um, in around Lawrence, Kansas, as an example of a terminal moraine. In fact, you can see it at the hill above my brother's house in uh, south of Lawrence, Kansas. It's really kind of fun. Geologists can map a rate of melting by looking at the location of a terminal moraine in the terminus of a glacier. Here's two pictures of glaciers at the left. Um, think about the different features we've talked about. Uh, what would be the origin of those stripes that we see in the Alpine Glacier on the right? Well, you have different um, little glaciers um, coming together and in the upper part of the picture this thing's flowing down to the lower right by the way and you notice that the edge of the gl glacier is scraping um, the mountains off it and then when the glaciers come together that scraped dark area that material is um, is um, moved right down the center of the glacier. Glaciers that reach the ocean may break off into icebergs or form an ice shelf um, they can break off and sink the Titanic. That's, that's how it sank. It, it hit an iceberg that came off a, a glacier uh, somewhere, uh, probably off of Greenland somewhere. And icebergs or ice shelves carry clay, sand, boulders that were eroded by the glacier. And then what happens is the ice melts in the ocean and all that sand and boulders and stuff that it has in the glacier drops down to the bottom of the ocean. And you can see those things in the bottom of the ocean. We call them dropstone deposits. Dropstone deposits. In most hot deserts, temperatures are high, annual rainfall is less than 10 inches, and evaporation exceeds precipitation. Desert surfaces are a combination of sand, 
desert pavement and rock outcrops. And you see all three there. Sand on the left, desert pavement in the middle, and rock outcrops on the right. And many deserts are located around 30 degrees north and south latitude. Uh, we call those subtropical deserts. Uh, some deserts are located in continental interiors far from moisture sources. And we call those continental deserts. Some are located along a coast where cold ocean water cools the air and it loses its moisture before reaching land. We call those coastal deserts. And remember, I, I mentioned Chile desert, the desert in uh, Chile a little bit ago. That's a coastal desert. Some are located in polar regions that are dry with relatively little ice or snow. We call those polar deserts. And some are found on the downwind side of a mountain range where the rain shadow affects affects it and uh, so you just don't have any moisture in the air when it descends in the landward side and that's a rain shadow desert. Well, deserts don't, don't have to be hot. They can be really cold but they have to be dry. They have to have less than 10 inches of annual precipitation a year to be a desert. Less than 10 inches a year. The area around the South Pole receives just a few centimeters of snowfall each year so is the South Pole a desert? Well, it is. Remember, a desert is a area that receives less than 10 inches of rain a year. So another question you might think about is, what's a desert island? Well, there's lots of islands that are around 30 degrees north in the middle of the ocean, and they aren't getting much rain either. So that you call them a desert island because it's desert on those islands. Well, let's look at deposition and erosion in the desert. Um, Sometimes you get flash floods and wind action that are responsible for eroding and transporting and depositing material in deserts. Um, and so we'll look at wind here right now. Uh, winds move sediment by suspension, by fi fine particles, so it's suspended in the air. By saltation, where you get bouncing grains, sand grains along the desert. And um, in a strong wind, if you um, if you're standing in a desert with um, uh, shorts on, uh, your legs are going to get pelted with sand and it can be like sandpaper. Um, and um, let's see, okay next. Okay. Oh yeah, you can get creep where you get uh, pebbles that are creeping along the surface. Uh, sand grains are deposited together to form sand dunes and you have a windward and a leeward, leeward side of a sand dune. Wind in this picture is coming from the left to the right. And the leeward side of the sand dune is called the slip face. And the reason you get sand deposited there is because you don't get as much wind and so um, without the wind energy sand drops out. And so the sand is eroding from the left to the right because the wind is blowing from the left here. And you get cross bedding. You get cross bedding in these sands, and this some of this is repetition from um, what we looked at when we looked at um, sedimentary rocks. But you get cross beds, and there's a pattern of sloping layers, and that slope is in the same direction that the wind blows. And so the cross bedding tells us which way the wind is blowing. And that's even true with ancient ancient uh, sand dunes that have been lithified as well. We're going to start talking about records of climate change in the geologic um, in the geologic record now and to think about this uh, we want to think about um, what if we were on an airplane that didn't have any windows and we flew somewhere pilot didn't well, tell us where we landed and we're trying to figure out what the climate was like there well that's what geology is like um, you just you, you just can't see it because it happened in the past well if you look at the last sentence here, um, a proxy is something we use in geology to tell something um, where we aren't there to look at it. And a proxy, in this case, would be a tree ring or an oxygen isotope or a microfossil that tells us something about the past by looking at it, even though we weren't there in the past. Um, to directly observe it. But we know that because, for example, 
a tree ring grows wider when there's lots of water to um, make the tree grow more, that it would have been a wetter climate. So that's an example of a proxy. So let's look at some of these proxies. Um, <clears throat> there's detailed, accurate data on temperature and precipitation that have occurred for about 150 years. And so we have average global temperatures that have taken, been taken from land and ship-based instruments since the 1850s. And since about 1979, we have satellites. And satellites tells us even very accurate temperature data. And if we look at the graphs of this um, temperature data since um, 1850s, what's the trend? Well, looks to me like the trend is getting warmer. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about these proxies. And again, I'm not trying to push the idea that global warming is true. We're looking at the information here, and you need to understand what's going on with the information, whether or not you agree with it. So let's look at the information. Um, there's been changes of climate patterns that have been influenced um, in past civilizations. Uh, Vikings, for example, migrated to Greenland and they farmed in Greenland. And then what happened after they moved to Greenland, it got cold and hostile and they couldn't live there anymore. We still see evidence that they used to live there and there's an example there um, from a Viking house uh, from uh, um, over a thousand years ago. It's really interesting to think about the history of climate change and how that's affected um, history. There's a good book I, I read um, I called A Distant Mirror by Barbara Tuchman and it's called The Calamitous, Calamita, Calamitous 14th Century. Well in the, in the in the 1300s, i.e. the 14th century, you had the Black Plague, you had the Little Ice Age, you had marauding bands of, uh, they had the Hundred Years War, marauding bands of knights going through and uh, raping and pillaging, and you had um, high instability among uh, political areas. Ah, sounds like some parts of the world today. Well, that was Europe. Um, and part, part of the problem is um, you had a little ice age going on, so the climate changed, and so you had migrations of people that had to leave where they lived or they, they, wouldn't have, they would have died. So they're migrating south to try and find somewhere to farm from the northern, northernmost parts of Europe. Um, so in, in, uh, when these paintings were done by, um, uh, for example, Peter Bruegel, the uh, winter landscape of the bird trap, it shows that European rivers froze over regularly. Well, that's, that's really rare today. And, and I remember as a kid in the 1970s, we'd regularly play uh, ice hockey on farms in Kansas ponds. And that was very normal activity most of the winter in the 1970s. Um, cultural records indicate three distinct climate periods in the northern hemisphere in the last thousand years or so. You had the medieval warm period. Temperatures were relatively warm from uh, 1000 to 1450 AD. And then you had the Little Ice Age. It was a time of very cold temperatures but not really an ice age. It occurred about 400 years after, for, for about 400 years after the medieval warm period. Um, and by the end of the 19th century, climate had moderated, uh, leading to our present relatively warm temperatures. And uh, those warm temperatures will probably exceed any in the last 1,000 years. So one proxy we've been talking about is to look at the history of, of what we can find from um, uh, just history going back um, as long as people have recorded um, indicators of temperature. Well, tree rings are another proxy. 
and you can see annual climate records in tree rings, lake sediments, and ice layers. So we're looking at a tree ring here, a tree, a cross section of a tree. And each year you get early wood, light wood, and, and late wood, dark growth. And so uh, one year is one light color and dark color together. And the wide rings occur during wet, warm years, and the narrow rings occurring during cold, dry years. And you can look at a tree like this and compare it to other trees and um, start to mix and match um, what you see from one um, in multiple trees and get a record of climate um, back hundreds of years. And then if you do that in multiple different um, trees that are like found in lakes or found in uh, rivers say by the Danube River or somewhere in, in Europe um, you can go back thousands of years and up to like 12,000 years just from tree rings um, here's a record of precipitation from tree ring analysis and so you can look at just analyze tree rings and tell when you had droughts and when you had uh, nice wet years. There's a drought in the 1950s. And so the tree rings are really narrow in the 1950s, for example. Precipitation records from 1895 onward were matched with tree ring widths to estimate precipitation values of pre 1895 tree rings. So what, what we did is we took the actual temperature records we have and precipitation records that where we've actually measured them in the last 150 years since 1850 and then use those to um, understand the tree rings from 1850 on or 1895 on and then use that to model on back to 1300. Jumping from tree rings to lake sediments a lake sediment is deposited in a pair of annual layers called varves. V-A-R-V-E-S, a varve. And a varve reflects a seasonal change in deposition of a lake. Uh, so here's an example of how you get a varve. Algae grows on the surface of a lake from spring to late fall, and it dies in the fall and sinks to the bottom, making a dark layer of sediment. Uh, sediment near lake margin comes from streams and is thicker during periods of high precipitation. So you, you might have an algae layer that's dark and that you get that that happens annually. Or you might have sediment that comes in from an annual uh, precipitation. And so it depends on the lake, depends on what kind of barge you get. Um, during cold parts of the year, much of a lake sediment is windblown dust and clay and so that's more of a lighter color and a varve can um, cover much longer periods of time the tree rings and hold a lot more information because you get things like pollen or um, um, chemical changes from weathering or organic remains or ash layers and then you can radiometrically date um, those ash layers and, and learn about it. There's one um, there's one lake in Japan that we talk about in some of our lecture, lectures that we do when we go into church groups and it's a uh, it's called Siogetsu Lake and it it has layers that we can count back and actually count um, back a hundred thousand years of these varves in that lake. Another proxy we can look at are the thickness of ice layers related to temperature and directly tie those to precipitation. Um, these are yearly layers that can be observed, counted, and studied for climate information. And oxygen isotopes are a good proxy for long-term climate change and ob observation about those. Um, <clears throat> isotope 18 of oxygen is heavier than isotope 16. 16 is much more abundant in the ocean than 18. And changes in these ratios of isotopes indicate changes of climates. The lighter um, 
Isotope 16 evaporates with seawater and is returned to the ocean through precipitation runoff. Well, when it's colder, um, oxygen 16 is incorporated into continental ice sheets, which causes the ocean to become more enriched with heavier oxygen 18 that's not evaporated and precipitated onto ice sheets. So the oxygen isotope record acts as a paleothermometer for ancient climates. And oxygen isotope ratios of ocean water are recorded in the calcium carbonate shells of microscopic foraminifera. And the ratios of these shells can tell us about the temperature and ice volume in oceans in the past. Large drops in biodiversity uh, usually correspond with sudden climate change. You get a lot of climate change and uh, suddenly you lose diversity of uh, life. Let's look at one of these little um, moving pictures of how this works with um, oxygen 16 and oxygen 18. Here we have oxygen 16 evaporating the water preferentially. Uh, because it's lighter and the precipitation is enriched with oxygen 16 in the water and that runs off and the oceans is runoff. So oxygen 16 to 18 ratio remains constant in the seawater. Well then in a glacial period you still have oxygen 14 or 16 um, evaporating preferentially except glacial ice stores the water um, that's enriched in oxygen 16. And seawater bec becomes progressively more enriched with oxygen 18. So we can we can tell whether there's more glaciers taking place by the 16 to 18 ratio of oxygen. And um, it's a very useful proxy on understanding climate change in the past. So we have these records of climate change and those records indicate that the northern hemisphere experience glaciation or, or an ice age a number of them during the last two million years and so if you look at the diagrams there uh, 18,000 years ago you had a continental ice sheet that covered um, uh, much of uh, Russia and Europe and uh, uh, over the whole of Canada down into the continental United States and Alaska was totally covered um, that ice sheet was almost two miles thick, very, very thick. And it created a land bridge between Siberia and Alaska. Um, and there were forests. It changed the whole climate in North America. There were forests um, south of that ice sheet. And the western deserts in the U.S. were much cooler. Um, you compare to the, uh, the ice sheets on the left, to the, where they are today and basically you have those ice sheets in Greenland now and that's about it. Uh, some more about records of climate change. Um, <clears throat> here's a reconstructed temperature record for the northern hemisphere. And the red line is actual instrument recorded temperature and the blue line is uh, reconstructed uh, temperature from climate proxy data. And the average line is the, uh, is the yellow line. Um, <clears throat> and then so that's the uh, that's the pink area in the lower graph that then takes um, and extends that uh, timing on back um, over before 15,000 years ago.
before, before yeah. And what we see there is we see that um, <clears throat> about 12,000 years ago, you had a really cold uh, period of time, and you actually had a glacial period, and then things started to warm up until the um, kind of temperatures we have today about 10,000 years ago, and it's been pretty stable for the last 10,000 years. Let's explain parts of this graph. And the Younger Dryas is a short, cold interval marked by the appearance of pollen and polar wildflower, uh, Dryas octopetala. And at the end of the Younger Dryas, uh, we encounter the Holocene, and that's our current interglacial time. We're in what's called an interglacial period now because um, the glaciers have melted and we don't have glaciers, continental glaciers now. The climate can change very quickly as evidenced by the graph at the left. Notice how quick the climate changed to get very cold um, and then very warm again. And at the end of the Younger Dryas, um, there about 12,000 years ago, the annual temperature of much of the northern hemisphere increased by uh, 12 degrees Fahrenheit in less than a decade. Very quickly, cha very quick change in temperature. When the last ice age is divided into cold glacial intervals and warmer interglacial periods, temperatures during the glacials were at least 9 to 18 degrees Fahrenheit colder than today on, on an average. And based on the length of the interglacials, we're about 10,000 years away from entering into another cold glacial interval. So you have the where the graphs are, graph areas are lower, you have glaciers. And where they're up above, you're between glaciers. And right now we're, we're in between a glacier, glacial period. Assuming the world doesn't end first. Okay, well here's a hypothesis. As a rapid warming at the end of an especial, especially cold interval causes catastrophic failure of northern hemispheric ice sheet putting surges of icebergs into the Atlantic. There's so much addition of so much fresh water that it slows the thermal haline circulation in the Gulf Stream and it causes a plummet of temperatures in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Then the longest ice core from Antarctica only records back less than a million years. And to model current climate, we must look at fossil chemistry and sedimentary rock records. Um, when we look at that, these proxies give us a record back to 66 million years ago. So we have to look at, at fossils and uh, sedimentary rock records to look way back. For so let's do that. Let's look back 65, 66 million years ago. 65 million years ago, that was the end of the Cretaceous. And if you remember from a near-Earth object, that's, that's when there was a drastic change in the... Uh, scenery on Earth as um, uh, that near-Earth object uh, destroyed most life on Earth. The end of the dinosaurs, the beginning of the mammal, mammal period. Okay, well, uh, 50 or 52 million years ago, uh, the Earth was really hot. And that means that the temperature between, the contrast between the poles and the equator was much less. There were no polar ice caps and there were alligator-like reptiles living in northern Canada because it was so warm. Um, 65 million years of climate change um, have uh, brought about, um, now it's much colder than it was, was back then. You can see the temperature dropping. Um, the present day is on the right, past is on the left. So some summary questions. What happens to tree ring patterns when there is a change from cold, dry climate to a warm, wet climate? Well, uh, 
tree rings. Witchgraph best portrays general temperature trends in the northern hemisphere for the last um, thousand years. Well, graph A does because you had um, a, a little ice age and then you had um, uh, temperatures going uh, drastically up to recently. Well, what are some natural causes of climate change? Um, man, the climate change isn't necessarily man-made. Um, I think people probably have a, a part in it, but there's some other things that cause climate change as well. And let's let's look at those. Um, <clears throat> well, changing locations of continents and oceans due to plate tectonics is a very likely cause of climate change. Uh, the changes in Earth's orbit around the sun causes changing climates. And the various in compositions in the atmosphere and concent concentrating more or less greenhouse gas, and remember the greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide or water vapor, that will um, give us climate change. Well, the last three major ice ages occurred when large land masses were located over one or both poles. Here you see a picture of Pangea, Pangea and um, a major ice age um, with uh, continental ice sheets in the South South Pole and then now we have lots of continents around the North Pole and so um, you have ice sheets around that too. It takes more than uh, polar ice though to create climate change. What else can happen? Well recall that water carries a lot of heat around the globe and ocean circulation patterns really have a big impact on climate and some examples of those are when we closed the connection between North and South America about three million years ago, it strengthened the Gulf Stream and made Europe much warmer. And when South America separated from Antarctica about 34 million years ago, it triggered large-scale glaciation in Antarctica and opened up circulation patterns in the Southern Oceans. Um, and it isolated the southern continents from the moderating climate influences of the, of the lower latitudes. Well, the Earth climate involves interaction um, and is changed by uh, interaction between the geosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and biosphere that we've been talking about through most of this uh, course. Um, also, small changes in the Earth's orbit on scales of ten to thousands of years can also influence climate change. And we call these the Milankovitch cycles. And the Milankovitch cycles are caused by the interaction of Earth with the gravitational fields of other planets. And there's three principal variations that um, affect the Milankovitch cycle. First of all is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. It's the shape of the Earth's orbit around the Sun and it varies from way more circular to being more elliptical and those changes occur in a hundred thousand year cycle. Right now we have more of a circular orbit around the Sun but sometimes it's more elliptical. Also we can get a change in the tilt of the Earth's axis. Um, right now the Earth's axis is tilted at 23 and a half degrees uh, but over a 41,000 year um, period, the tilt can change from 22 to 25 degrees. And those changes of angle um, affect the solar radiation where it strikes the Earth. Then precession also affects um, climate. And precession is the wobbling, if, if you think of a top, when the top spins it wobbles a little bit. And the same thing is true with the Earth as it rotates. Um, so it takes 23,000 years for the axis of the Earth to make a complete round trip back to where it started. And, um, well, today the Earth's axis is tilted toward the sun during the summer months. In 11,500 years, it'll be the exact opposite. So um, that would just change the seasons backwards, wouldn't it? Let's look at a little cartoon of the Milankovitch cycles. And I'll go ahead and play this. We have the eccentricity cycle, 
there's the eccentricity cycle and that um, gets more elliptical or more circular and then we have the um, axial tilt cycle it's 23 and a half degrees now but um, it can tilt more or less between 22 and 25 degrees and then we have the precession cycle where the earth is um, wobbling a little bit like a top so here we have them all together Well, what combination of changes in the Milankovitch cycles would cause the highest and lowest summer temperatures in North America? Well, any combination of factors that increases the tilt angle and decreases the distance between the Earth and the Sun will increase the summer temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, an example, a contracted orbit due to eccentricity with increased tilt due to precession and increased tilt would cause that and the opposite would be true for decreased temperature well would the amount of incoming solar radiation increase or decrease in the arctic circle during july in the northern hemisphere if the earth's axis were vertical rather than tilted if the earth's orbit brought it closer to the sun or if the tilt of the earth's axis were opposite to its present orientation away from the sun well if the Earth's axis were vertical rather than tilted, um, it would decrease the amount of incoming solar radiation. If the Earth's orbit brought it closer to the Sun, we'd have a small increase in solar radiation. And if the tilt of the Earth's axis were opposite to its present orientation away from the Sun, that we would decrease the amount of uh, solar radiation that came into us. Which graph displays changing temperature trends moving from pole to pole along a line of lati of longitude a line of longitude longitude is um, um, the, the lines that go from north to south in other words how far east and west you are well graph c would be um, displaying change of temperature trends moving from pole to pole a line of long long, long longitude well, which graph displays changing cloud cover trends moving from the equator to the North Pole along a line of longitude? Well, graph B. And describe features that would cause the temperature of a region of the Earth's surface to decrease. Well, if you have a surface albedo increase, in other words, um, more sunlight is reflected, lower solar output, in other words, the sun doesn't give us as much radiation. More reflective high clouds, more sunlight is reflected in space. Increased orbital distance, in other words, the Earth's further away from the sun. Decreasing tilt of the Earth's axis, um, the Earth is not quite as tilted as much. Changes in distribution of continents, um, plate tectonics moves continents differently than